August 23rd, tens of thousands of people rally at the National Mall to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which drew a quarter million people to the nation's capital and was a key moment in the civil rights movement. The Real News Jason Knorr caught up with Ahamu Baraka, a longtime human rights activist, writer and fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., who authored the recent piece, Obama Should Not Be Welcome at the March on Washington Commemoration. Uh, I wrote a piece recently where I claimed, where I made the, the, the statement that Obama should not be welcome at the August 28th commemoration on the march for the March on Washington. And I said that because uh, I think it's sort of sacrilegious that the President of the United States would be invited uh, to an event that represents uh, something so special for black people and oppressed people. Uh, that where we are now in a position to begin to talk about the meaning of the, of the march in 63, uh, to assess where we are as a people and as a movement, to inject the politics of the state into that process by inviting the president, uh, to me is, is, a, is, a, is a move that uh, undermines our ability to exercise uh, autonomy and self-determination, to give meaning to our own experiences. I said also too that it, it, it represents the turning over the event to the state. It gives them a propaganda victory that they have been attempting to achieve uh, ever since Dr. King was assassinated. And that is to completely um, uh, absorb his, 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 his image and understanding of what he was about in our movement to merge uh, Dr. King and our movement with the interests of the U.S. state and the U.S. society. And for that, uh, I think that is something we have to oppose. And so no, no politicians were allowed to speak at the original March on The issue I have with, with uh, the invitation on the 28th is that uh, the President of the United States uh, a black, our first black president has been invited to speak in the shadow of Dr. King. The implication, of course, being that there is a straight line between uh, Dr. King and our movement and the, 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 the person of Barack Obama as the first black president. It gives the impression that he represents our aspirations and the goals of our movement. And I think that that is something that we have to oppose. So it's, it's politicizing the march uh, in a way that, that de-radicalizes our movement and suggests the dominance of one narrative. And that narrative is the narrative of, of the aspirations of black people wanting just to be inclus included into the U.S. narrative. And that's something that negates uh, our history, the totality, the comprehensive nature of our history of struggle struggle for, for liberation, struggle for social justice. And you talk about um, foreign policy. That's one of the key parts in your piece. You talk about how uh, Dr. King's view is expressed on U.S. foreign policy, called the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. How, how that compares to the Obama administration's foreign policy? The attempt to, to link uh, Dr. King, who is a, uh, a person committed to peace, uh, nonviolence uh, with the policies of Barack Hussein Obama uh, is in fact an abomination. Uh, Barack Hussein Obama has been at the forefront of the, one of the most aggressive periods of U.S. Uh, imperialist uh, activity uh, over the last 50 years. There's no way we can reconcile Dr. King's uh, commitment to uh, peace and to uh, nonviolence uh, with the aggressive, violent, ridden uh, policies of Barack Obama. Uh, the very fact that, uh, that uh, this administration is responsible for formatting uh, civil war in Syria, uh, didn't have the moral courage to call the coup in Egypt a coup, attempted to stop uh, President Aristide from Haiti returning back to his country, uh, 
who, who denied the people of Honduras uh, support when they called out for the U.S. to reject the, the, the coup in Honduras. Uh, these are policies that a Dr. King and our movement could never embrace. But yet these are the policies of this government. And by inviting the president, uh, we basically legitimize those policies. Uh, we, we give it a moral standing that is the opposite of what Dr. King was all about. And those are policies that, especially with foreign policy, that Democrats and Republicans have completely and utterly embraced. The, 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 so I'm saying it's it's, that is the mainstream. That is, there's hardly any dissent in, talked about in, in, within the mainstream of those policies. There's been, there's been a bipartisan agreement on advancing the interests of American uh, imperialism. But there's no distinction between the positions of the Democrats or the Republicans when it comes to that. There may be some tactical differences, but that's really about it. That the, uh, the aggressiveness of uh, the militarism of this administration is something that both Democrats and Republicans embrace. And it's something that's contrary to everything that we have been about as a people here in this country. So this is um, so this would be speculation, but judging by uh, Dr. King's works and what he said, um, what would his position be today if he was alive today? Would he, would he take part in this march? What would his role be today if he was alive? Uh, if Dr. King was alive today, Dr. King probably would not have been invited to this march today, and certainly wouldn't wouldn't have been invited to the event on the 28th, because the organizers of the march today and primarily on the 28th, are not interested in any contrarian voices, um, any voices that might uh, criticize U.S. foreign policy or the direction of, of domestic policy. Dr. King would be excluded uh, because Dr. King's positions, like the traditional positions of the, of the Black Liberation Movement, are positions on the side of the oppressed, committed to social justice, and committed to peace completely contrary to everything that we see in place today. And if he was alive today, what do you think that he would be calling for or demanding or probably out in the streets fighting for or getting arrested for? I think that Dr. King would be uh, calling for the uh, a moral foreign policy in Egypt. He would be calling for the uh, to cease the drone attacks by the U.S. administration. Uh, he would have been opposed to the persecution of Edward Snowden and would have condemned the, the sentence received by uh, Bradley Manning. He would call on the U.S. to cease its commitment to undermining regimes and governments across the uh, globe. So he'll be on the outside with the rest of us protesting and voicing his opposition to the direction of this country. And um, what are your thoughts about uh, the leadership, the civil rights leadership that put this march on? We know that the, the leaders, the so-called leadership that put this march on are individual organizations that basically are, are mirages. They don't exist. They have no real social base. Their, their importance uh, is defined by uh, the importance they have for the American state. The importance they have to them for the American state that they are media appointed leaders. Now, the fact that they were able to mobilize a massive numbers on Saturday is more a reflection of the desire on the part of the people to struggle, to struggle for change, to believe in, in the possibility of change, to, uh, to be committed to raising their voice for justice. It's more reflective of that than any uh, ability of these, of these self-appointed leaders to be, a, to be legitimate voices for our people. That for most of us who believe in social justice, who believe in the possibility of, of a new world, uh, we're going to be standing on the outside on August 28th. We're going to say that it is a, a shame that anybody who says that they are part of our movement, who say they believe in Dr. King's vision, uh, would stand alongside an individual who we consider to be a war criminal.